Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 352, featuring a new series of interviews with Mr. Lawrence Schick, one of my personal heroes. Now Mr. Schick is probably best known today as being the lore master for the Older Scrolls Online, uh, but he's got roots that go way, way back. He's one of the few people, as a matter of fact, that's worked with both Gary Gygax, uh, the uh, co-creator of D&D, and Sid Meier, the creator of Civilization Pirates and many other games. The reason I say he's uh, one of my, uh, Mr. Schick is one of my personal heroes, though, is that he wrote a book called Heroic Worlds, The History of Role-Playing Games, and that directly inspired me to write Dungeons and Desktops, The uh, History of Computer Role-Playing Games, and ignited all of this stuff that eventually led to the Matt Chat Show that you are watching right now. So it's really an honor to get to sit down with Mr. Schick. Now, I know you are just as excited as I am, so without further ado, here is Mr. Lawrence Schick. All right, folks. I am here with the great Lawrence Schick. He's the former head and design. Of, uh, he's the former head of design and development at TSR, creator of the White Plume Mountain module for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. The uh, I saw this described as the puzzle dungeon to end all puzzle dungeons. Uh, he's also the lore master for the Elder Scrolls Online, the uh, glue that holds the background together, as it were. And as all, if all this wasn't cool enough, uh, he's also written uh, several game manuals, a fabulous history of RPGs called Heroic Worlds that I highly recommend to you guys. Uh, and he's also writes, translates, and anthologizes uh, swashbuckling, uh, swashbuckling fiction under the pen name Lawrence Ellsworth. Uh, how are you today, Lawrence? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Doing great. Uh, now, I know a lot of people have interviewed you about being the lore master of uh, The Elder Scrolls Online. I definitely want to get to that. But I wanted to start a bit earlier in your career. Uh, I understand you got into Dungeons & Dragons at Kent State University. Uh, is it fair to say that that experience changed your life? Well, it certainly gave me a, uh, a root of expression. Uh, I, I had always known as a youth that I wanted to uh, be some kind of a writer, uh, do some kind of storytelling. And I had also been a longtime uh, gamer of uh, uh, traditional board games, card games, and the early uh, war games of uh, Avalon Hill. Um, and uh, so Dungeons and Dragons combined uh, gaming and storytelling uh, in a way that I took to just immediately. I mean, my mother was an artist, my father was an engineer. So um, here was a way to, to quantify and uh, uh, quantify stories and turn them into something that could be shared with others. Uh, and that was great. Um, and uh, it needed to be written about clearly. So there was a clear root and need for, for, uh, for writers uh, who understood both uh, how to convey rules clearly and how to tell a story. So that was perfect. So it wasn't too long after you were introduced to the game that you uh, began work on what would become White Plume Mountain. Uh, which used uh, later to impress the powers that be at TSR to give you a job. Uh, now, people that play the game familiar with the uh, the history of it know this is one of the best uh, modules ever, uh, particularly among those who like puzzles. Uh, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about how you created this module, uh, what was going on at the time? I noticed in some interviews you're kind of, you kind of seem a little humble about it nowadays. Uh, I seem a little, uh, maybe because of the material that was inspired by Michael Moorcock. Well, the only thing that really inspired by Michael Moorcock was uh, was the sword Black Razor, which is obviously a cognate for for Stormbringer, uh, and which I deliberately included to show that I could adapt stuff from from other media into game terms. Um, but uh, by the time I wrote White Plume Mountain, I had been uh, playing and, and running uh, Dungeons and Dragons games uh, in Ohio with my friend Tom Molday uh, for several years, and uh, then an opportunity came up. For, there was a design opening at TSR, and I decided I was going to get it. Uh, they wanted a sample uh, module. Um, so I just uh, took, I just went back through all my uh, dungeon designs and uh, harvested out uh, all the best bits uh, and found a, a conceit to hold them together. Um, uh, and uh, that's what, uh, uh, that's where White Plume Mountain came from. It was, 
was really just a, a great big sampler of ideas to show my chops. Um, and uh, they decided that they liked it well enough. Uh, Gary decided to, uh, that they would uh, buy it and publish it and, without changing a word, which astonished me. Uh, and I got the job, which was great. So it, it did what it was supposed to do. I had uh, Mike Whitwer on the show not too long ago. I don't know if you've seen his book, Empire of Imagination, but it's a biography of Gary Gygax. And uh, I was really intrigued in that book. He paints uh, Mike paints a very sort of complex picture of, of Gary, what, what he was like. I was just wondering, as someone who was there you know, sort of at the time, how would you describe what it was like working at TSR? Well, uh, uh, it, it was a bit like, you know, riding the hurricane. Um, we were... Uh, Everything we were doing, we were making up new. Uh, it, it, it basically hadn't been done before. Uh, so there weren't any rule books for writing these rule books. Um, we, uh, uh, we had to figure out the whole business and how to convey it to people uh, in a fashion that, uh, that had not previously existed. It was a new art form. Um, so, uh, and it was, in, it was uh, uh, burgeoning and booming and... Uh, uh, making a lot of money, and there were some big egos involved, uh, and so uh, it was. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, combinations of hasty decisions and indecisions, and uh, uh, missed opportunities and grabbed opportunities, um, and everything was coming at you all the time from every direction. So it was. Uh, it was it was a, a real fascinating time. Uh, it prepared me well for going into uh, entertainment software development, which then turned out to be its own kind of wild ride. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to me that this early history of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I know you you said in some other interviews that uh, you felt like TSR could have uh, co-opted computer R, uh, computer RPGs. It could have done collectible card games. Uh, there's all this kind of, all, all sorts of stuff they should have been in, uh, leading instead of uh, you know having to uh, sort of catch up to later, right? I mean, while you were there, did you feel like you were sort of the voice uh, in the wil crying in the wilderness, and they just weren't listening to you? Oh, there were an awful lot of voices to listen to at that point. Um, uh, my main thing for the time that I was at, at, at TSR, um, which was you know maybe pivotal, but wasn't really all that long, uh, was uh, you know a couple couple of years, um, was that uh, I wanted them to go from being a, a hobby publisher uh, into uh, something that looked and felt like um, mass market publishing, book publishing or game publishing like then Parker Brothers or Milton Bradley or Mattel. Um, I, I had no experience with that myself since I was right out of college, but I knew what it, I knew what it looked like. Uh, and so that's what I, I wanted to try to move them toward. Uh, was uh, to make the games accessible without sacrificing depth, um, which I, I think we we did with our first versions of the basic and expert sets, uh, and uh, make everything more graphically legible and professional looking, um, and uh, uh, something that would that would look good in a store shelf. Um, it, it didn't look like it was. Uh, it should have a Ziploc bag over it. Um, so, uh, you know, it, that was a lot to try to do all at once, but that was my my agenda. And speaking of Ziploc bags, and I was just thinking so many of those early computer games came in those <laughs> zip, Ziploc bags, which uh, brings me to my next question. Uh, now, you were one of the first guys uh, to go from this paper gaming industry into the, uh, into the video games industry. I was just wondering, uh, why did you decide to make that transition? Well, uh... At the time, which is 1981, 1982, uh, there were not very many game design jobs at all anywhere in the world. There are now more professional game designers on staff in Maryland than there were on the planet in 1982. Um, so uh, there weren't a whole lot of opportunities uh, for doing uh, real interesting stuff. And so uh, when... Uh, uh, my friends uh, Janelle Jaquez and Michael Stackpole um, uh, were uh, brought on at Coleco uh, to do some uh, some work there as they were going to get into uh, early uh, video gaming. 
Uh, they knew me from paper games, and uh, they brought they brought me aboard as well. Uh, that was a that was a great opportunity. It turned out that the mindset that you needed to design complicated paper games was exactly the same kind of mindset you needed to design entertainment software. Uh, pro computer programs work the same way. Um, so it was uh, it was a surprisingly easy transition mentally, at least. Um, and then I, you know, made a career for the next decade out of bringing other people in from uh, from paper games into uh, uh, into computer gaming, and it worked out quite well. Yeah, I guess it's a small role. I know uh, Janelle. I've had her on the show before. Is uh, you know Dave Warhol by any chance too? The oh, yes. Yeah, he, he's also been on. <laughs> uh, so you were, were at Coleco, I guess, for a while, right? And I wanted to. Uh, I had a question sent in to me by. Uh, Game Development Research Institute, or GDRI, uh, they were asking if you could say a little bit more about your time at Coleco and if you dealt with any of their contractors. Uh, this is a mysterious area, they say. Uh, yes, uh, because in-house on staff at Coleco I acted as both game designer and product manager, um, often dealing with outside uh, uh, programming firms, which at the time meant, you know, one to four guys somewhere on the planet uh, in another time zone, usually. Um, most interesting group I dealt with uh, on a number of products uh, was a team out of the Twin Cities called 4D Interactive Systems, which you might have heard of. Uh, three of the Ds uh, were for Dave's. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave McGarry, who first designed a dungeon uh, a board game, uh, Dave Wesley, who was critical in the early uh, development of role-playing, and Dave Arneson, who was, of course, the co-creator of Dungeons & Dragons with Gary Gygax. Um, they uh, were a early game software development firm, and we worked uh, on a number of titles with them. One of the ones you worked on, or maybe did, was an adaptation of Zaxxon. And I saw a review of that that said it called it the uh, an almost perfect translation of an arc of the arcade version a feat that was impossible on any other console at the time. Uh, so it was. It must have been an incredible challenge. Well, it, it was so that because Zaxxon was a uh, uh, you know even for an arcade game at the time it was advanced because it was a diagonal scrolling game. Uh, it was it was uh, an early sort of iso attempt to do an isometric viewpoint um, and. Uh, uh, I actually worked on five versions of Zaxxon for Coleco on different platforms. Uh, the only one where we could actually duplicate the diagonal scrolling uh, was on the ColecoVision because that was the only one that had enough uh, uh, processing uh, uh, to manage it. Uh, so uh, we had to change the viewpoint on the uh, Intellivision and uh, Atari 2600 versions. Um, but uh, no, that was fun. It was, uh, it was real interesting to try to because we got no information from the coin-op companies on, on these arcade games, so we had to reverse engineer them uh, down to the tiniest uh, 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 milliseconds uh, in order to figure out how to uh, how to replicate the experience of the arcade games on the uh, smaller home consoles. Why didn't they give you the information? Uh, because they didn't have it. <laughs> these things were designed by small teams. Uh, nothing was documented. It was all done by by look and feel, um, and so they would give you a they would give you the arcade game and say, "Here it is. Make that on your little box," uh, and that's what we had to do. That's just amazing. That's, so, how did you end up at Microprose? Uh, well, after I uh, after I left Coleco, um, uh, after the the first video game crash. Uh, in the, in the mid '80s, um, I freelanced for a while, uh, doing uh, uh, computer game documentation and such like, um, and uh, then uh, heard about an opportunity um, at uh, at Microprose uh, from uh, uh, from another former uh, war gamer, um, and uh, applied and uh, and got the job and went to work for them, um, and that was uh, you know. That was real, real interesting as well. Got to work closely with Sid Meier. Um, in fact, I'm the only guy in the business uh, who has worked closely with both Sid Meier and Gary Gygax, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> Two very different personalities, uh, I'm sure. Very different. Uh, diametrically opposed. 
but both very creative and influential, obviously. So Airborne Ranger, that was a, a, a top-selling game. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your development of that of that game? I mean, it must have been a huge uh, change from working on Zaxxon to going to uh, Airborne Ranger. Not as much as you might think. I mean, it was uh, a top-down scrolling uh, combat game, right? Um, it was uh, it was certainly my biggest seller for Microprose. Um, but what really made that one cook was that uh, we created... Um, a uh, procedurally generated maps, map terrain for every mission, uh, so that the missions were never the same. Uh, and I was able to do that because of my experience in paper games with things like, you know, uh, dungeon generation systems and stuff like that. Uh, so I was able to come up with a simple but uh, relatively deep system that, that got... Um, very playable maps that uh, made every mission different every time you played it. And I think that was really uh, critical to the success of that game. That plus the timing, uh, Twitch games like that, very all about the timing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of some of the reviews I read mentioned how much they liked the manual uh, that shipped with the game. It had this history of the, of the Rangers in there. Uh, I know this is kind of one of your hallmarks, right? <laughs> uh, so oh, it's the advantage of being a writer. Uh, I wrote all the manuals for, for the games at, uh, at Microprose, and that was one of the selling points uh, for, uh, for Microprose games at the time in the 1980s, was that they came with uh, uh, really dense and well-researched uh, manuals about the uh, uh, historical bases of the, of the game in question. Yeah, it seems like this this combination of extensive research and the documentation that ships with the game that was a secret to the success of those games. Uh, was it a similar process with the Silent Service, uh, Task Force nineteen forty two, and Sword of the Samurai? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, the uh, the thing that I learned from Sid Meier uh, is that you don't necessarily do the research first. Uh, even on a game that is ostensibly a historical simulation. Instead, you first figure out what the player thinks is fun about that simulation, that, about that historical situation. Then you design the game around that. Um, keep putting in all the parts that actually made it sort of resemble reality, and then throw out all the boring ones. So that the only things that was left were the fun parts, and that's the essential game. And then once you have gotten down to the fun parts, you just pretend that it's a simulation of the entire experience. Uh, and then you do your research based on the, the fun parts that have become the, uh, the framework uh, of the actual experience. So just out of curiosity, what, what's not fun about being a samurai? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, you're uh, the tool of an oppressive regime. <laughs> uh, you know, killing innocent people and... Uh, 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 murdering your opponents, I guess. I mean, maybe that is fun. I don't know. <laughs> we make, we emphasize that part, anyways, uh, as part as it was fun. That was, of course, the follow-on uh, to uh, to Sid's Pirates. Uh, Sid was a war gamer uh, and an action gamer, um, but uh, uh, he was unfamiliar with role-playing games, and so that was one of the things that I actually introduced him to. Um, I, I showed him how tabletop uh, role-playing games worked, and uh, uh, introduced him to uh, uh, how to how to get stories into games, uh, and that fascinated him. And that's that's where pirates came from. And then we followed that up with uh, with my uh, sort of the samurai and his uh, covert action. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two. And the best is yet to come in this interview series. Believe you me. Lots and lots of great stuff, so stay tuned. I know you don't want to miss it. As always, I want to thank you very, very much for your support of this show. Could not do Map Chat without your help. Now, if you uh, would like to help the show, you can tell some people about it, uh, or uh, you can donate. All I ask is a dollar per episode to keep these uh, shows in production. It's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work, and I really need your help to make these, uh, make these episodes. So please, if you haven't already, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site and or the uh, mattchat.us and find your way to the PayPal uh, donation. Either way, I just really appreciate your help. 
tremendously, guys. It really means a lot to me, so thank you. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, well, first of all, I have some great personal news. Uh, this is uh, what I'm holding here is Vintage Games 2.0, an insider look at the most influential games of all time. Now, this is a complete rewrite of the first Vintage Games book I did with uh, Bill LeJudas. I think it's back in 2006 or so. And I think this one is much better, new and improved, and loaded with all kinds of fun stories uh, for anyone who's interested in the video games industry. Now, uh, if you want to get a copy of this, uh, just go to Amazon or the link in the show notes to the publisher page. And right now, for some reason, the link to the publisher page has a cheaper price uh, than Amazon. So you might want to shop around, see if you can get the best price on this. But either way, I think you're really going to enjoy this book. And I'm uh, I'll hopefully have more to say about this in future episodes. But uh, for now, just go check it out. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. But I think you'll really, really enjoy it. So go get a copy. Now, in other news, uh, Stig wrote in with a couple of items. Uh, first is about this new game called Ember. Uh, this just launched on Steam. It's a classic role-playing game with a deep branching story, endless exploration across dynamic environments, a, a robust skill tree, and an intricate crafting system. Now, what I love, love about it, though, it's an indie project that took 10 years to make, and it's an homage to classic role-playing games. It's made by Infusion Interactive out of uh, New, New Jersey. Now, I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I have uh, purchased it, and it's installed on my computer just waiting for me to finish this episode so I can go try it out. Uh, if you've tried it out, though, already, uh, just let me know in the show notes what you think about it. Really uh, like to get your take. And also, if you want me to get the developer on, uh, onto a match chat, maybe I can interview him. That'd be pretty fun. All right, and then uh, lastly, Bethesda has uh, some news. <clears throat> Apparently, the mods for Fallout 4 and Skyrim will not be available on the PS4. Uh, so apparently they were promised uh, something didn't work out. We don't seem to really know what, why, what happened here. Uh, but for whatever reason, Sony decided not to uh, support the mods on the PS4. Uh, now, I don't have a PS4, so this doesn't really make any difference to me, but I'm always I like to get other takes on this. Do you think this is a big deal? Uh, does this make you hate Sony? You know, what is your, what is your take on it? Uh, let me know. Love to uh, discuss it with you in the show notes. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. Wow, well, better hurry. I actually ran out of uh, space on my video camera, so I had to re-record all these segments. This is probably why my voice is about to give out. Maybe this will make things better. This is a werewolf howling ginger beer. Uh, so I was at a world market the other day, and I noticed they had all of these sort of Halloween-themed uh, sodas available. And this was a werewolf-themed one, uh, a werewolf-themed ginger beer. Now, how can you go wrong with that? A little write-up here about the werewolf. I assume you're familiar with the tale, though, so I'll spare you that. And it is uh, brewed by the Orca Beverage Soda Works out of Mukultio. Mukultio? Mukultio? Man, I just looked up the pronunciation. I already forgot it, so sorry, guys. Uh, anyway, Washington. So let's get this uh, werewolf open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this werewolf howling ginger beer here in the uh, rather excellent drinking horn. Now, I just noticed there's a warning on the bottle, caution, very hot, drink with care. Uh, and it, it does list uh, hot peppers, actually, as one of the ingredients, hot pepper extracts. So I know ginger by itself can be kind of spicy sometimes. If they've added hot pepper, uh, this might indeed have me howling. So uh, we'll see. Uh, Smell-wise, uh, almost uh, sort of tickling my nasal cavities a little bit here, but you can definitely smell the ginger. A little bit of a citrusy aroma too. It smells just really nice. I don't know if you notice that in the uh, picture picture of it in the glass. It's sort of got a pink uh, coloration to it, which is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a taste. <clears throat> it's definitely got some heat to this. Uh, the pepper's a little bit more pronounced than I thought. It sort of goes down hot, and then there's a yeah. You know, the aftertaste is pretty hot too. Kind of reminds me of some of those uh, chili beers, if you ever had one of those. Uh, you definitely taste the ginger, a little bit of kind of a Sprite, uh, maybe uh, a Sierra Mist kind of flavor there. Uh, but really what you're tasting is that uh, the ginger taste and the heat. So 
It's exactly what you want, I think, in a ginger beer. I'll give it another taste here. You know, I'm really, I'm really liking this. It's uh, really got enough heat in there to slow you down so you don't want to chug this. Uh, the aftertaste uh, lingers for a while. It's a little bit hot, but if you like the heat, I think you will enjoy it. Uh, the ginger is uh, just at the right amount, I think. It's not overpowering. Uh, and the peppers are really kind of an interesting addition. I don't know if I've had a ginger beer with the hot pepper extracts before, uh, but it really is a really nice combination. Let me give it a uh, one more taste here. Yeah, you know, all in all, I have to say I like it. It's a little uh, interesting because of the, the pepper extract and the heat factor. It's kind of burning the back of my throat right now. Uh, but it's also sweet without being too sweet, and I like the, the level of uh, ginger flavor in this. Uh, just about the right amount. Uh, you know, I really don't know how you could criticize this. It's not going to be for everybody, obviously, because of that hot pepper. Uh, if you don't like hot things, uh, you'll probably hate this. Uh, just don't even try it. Uh, but if you like a little bit of heat, or even better, a lot, of, it's kind of burning my lips right now. Yeah, so this is uh, getting hotter. I, I guess I probably will be howling a little later. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I, I like it, so I'm going to go five out of five drinking horns on this. I'll again, I'll caveat, not for everybody, but if you like heat and you like ginger beer, I think you'll uh, enjoy this one. Uh, so five out of five on the Werewolf Howling Ginger Beer. Really good choice. So let's wrap this up with a quote. And then I was looking for quotes about egos, and that brought me into quotes by Freud, and then on to insanity and psychosis and neurosis and all this good stuff. And I finally found a good quote about madness. Uh, this one from the late, great Robin Williams uh, that I think really fits the bill here goes something like this. You're only given a little spark of madness. You mustn't lose it. See you guys next week. existing brain cells.